So welcome this morning. It's good to see you. Morning. <laughs> morning. I always get a good good morning from Miss Aubrey. She's always happy to be here. Oh, I hope the rest of you are as well. I've had a wonderful week. I hope the rest of you have too. That was a resounding silence. <laughs> it's not been a wonderful week. All right, well, let's talk about that. We'll scrap this, and you can tell me your problems. No, that's not what we're doing today. I do have a message for you. I hope you're doing well and ready to hear it. If you would turn with me in the book of Psalms, we're going to look at chapter 18, verses 37 through 45 this morning is our reference text. Psalm chapter 18, verses 37 through 45. As you're flipping for that, if you're taking notes and you like titles, this morning's message title is Just in Time. How many of you find that God gives you everything you need in great abundance so far ahead of time that you never have to worry about anything, there's no stress in your life, and you just kind of sit back and dole out what needs to be as it comes to you? Is that what you find God does for you? I have not had that experience. If you have somehow tapped into an abundance with the Lord that resembles what I just described, like just printing money spiritually all the time, please tell me how you did that. I would like to plant that tree, sow those seeds, pray those prayers, live in that location where that happens for you, because I have not found that to be the case. I have a God that I have found to be more of a just-in-time God, and we're going to talk about what that looks like this morning. I hope you've had time to find Psalm. Psalms chapter 18, verse 37, and we're going to read through verse 45. I pursue my enemies and overtake them. I do not turn back until they're wiped out. I crush them, and they cannot get up. They fall beneath my feet. You've closed me, clothed me with strength for battle. You subdue my adversaries beneath me. You've made my enemies retreat before me. I annihilate those who hate me. They cry for help, but there is no one to save them. They cry to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I pulverize them like dust before the wind. I trample them like mud in the streets. You have freed me from the feuds among people. You've appointed me the head of nations, a people I had not known serve me. Foreigners submit to me grudgingly as soon as they hear, and they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and come trembling from their fortifications. Come to the Lord with me in prayer one more time. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you'll bless the reading of it today. And God, now I, I pray specifically that you'll bless my words. Lord, that what I say will be from you and that what comes from you will be remembered and that what comes out of me that's not inspired by you will be forgotten so that your purpose is accomplished here in this message today. I trust that you've prepared the ears and hearts of those you've gathered to hear it. So now at this time, God, let me be an apt deliverer of the message you've given me this morning so that your work can be done. In your name we pray. Amen. So... This is David who wrote Psalm. We all know David at this point. I've talked about him a lot. If you haven't heard me talk about him, surely you've heard someone mention David. He's the who? The manic depressive guy. What? The manic depressive guy? Yeah, he's the one that's either completely on top of the world and nothing could be better and God has triumphed over my enemies and everything is great and nothing can ever go wrong and la di da let's conquer the world. And then five minutes later, David is, oh Lord, have you forgotten me? Oh, woe is me, I tear my clothes and cover myself in ashes and hide under a rock and eat fuzzy worms and want to die. David didn't have an in-between. David's either on top of the world or carrying the whole thing on his own shoulders. And we find David here in one of his moments of being way on top of the world. He's singing about all the great things of God. In fact, he's recently been rescued from the hand of Saul, an evil king who preceded him who wanted to kill him. A really difficult situation he found himself in. We're going to explore a little deeper this morning. But he's been delivered from this person that literally wanted to murder him more than anything in the world. And he's so excited at the end of this time that he writes this psalm. And in my, in my Bible, it's actually titled, A Praise for Deliverance. And so he goes, and David, not being a much of a musician himself at this point in his life, he wrote a lot of songs and had played music in the past, but I don't know if he's gotten old and his hands are battle-worn or what it is, but he relegates the writing of music to his worship leader most of the time at this point in his life. So he, being the songwriter, the lyricist still, the poet, says, I've written these words, I've been delivered from the hand of Saul, you, my music minister... Take these words and write a song as a praise for deliverance that's happened. And here's all the great things that the Lord has done. Here's what the enemies do when they see us coming. Here's what the other armies will do. People of other nations think we're so great and are so enamored by our God that they're willing to just fall down and pledge their allegiance to us because they don't want to fight. It's a spectacular situation. 
But David didn't arrive at this place overnight, though his emotions might sometime make us think he was up and he was down. I want to look a little bit at 1 Samuel about what was happening literally moments before David wrote this poem of great praise and excitement to God, singing about how wonderful things were. If you look back at 1 Samuel, and I'm not, you can go back, it's the entire book. We're not going to read the whole book this morning. Just know this story is in 1 Samuel as I paraphrase it today. In 1 Samuel, we find a David who was a young shepherd, unex, unexperienced, insignificant young man. And yet, there's a Philistine, we've heard the David and Goliath story, who says, I want to destroy the nation of Israel and stand against God's people, and all the warriors of Israel are afraid of him. He's a huge man with a huge sword who has a penchant for cutting people's heads off. Not the kind of guy you want to fight. He's bigger than me, stronger than me, and he wants to cut me to pieces. Ah, that's a hard pass, Lord. I'm not interested. Thank you very much. And yet, David says, who dares stand up to the army of the Lord? I'll go fight this guy. David goes out with a sling in his pocket and grabs a couple of rocks off the ground and kills the giant. Suddenly, he becomes a very important person that all the nation of Israel knows about. And Saul becomes very jealous. But because the people like him so much and Saul is a man who wants to please the people, Saul says, well, I guess I'll appoint him to some, some important place. So it makes them a general of the army. And so now David's in charge of armies and he's taking armies out. And when he goes out and leads the army, they kill tens of thousands of people with a tiny little Israelite army who doesn't have the greatest technology in the world. They don't have the greatest warriors in the world, but they have the greatest God. And they have this young man who's willing to follow the Lord, lead them into battle. And they wipe out entire nations and they come home. And David's done this in service to the Lord, but also in service to Saul, his leader. And when he comes home and people are praising him for doing what Saul sent him to do in the first place, Saul gets jealous and says, they like David too much. He's a threat to me. And so if you read through the Bible, you find in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 12. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You find in the 18th chapter of Samuel that Saul, for the first time, openly says something must be done about David, and he begins to plot to kill him. He starts doing things like keeping David at home instead of sending him away to the battle. David, who's gone out and fought wars and done great things and saved the nation of Israel from invasion and certain destruction, suddenly Saul says, you're grounded. I know you're the captain of my army, but what you're going to do is when I have a bad day, you're going to come play music for me. David's like, really? Instead of having a sword, you want me to just sit here with my guitar and play music to make you feel better. I, I could be out doing something so much better, Lord. I could be out doing something so much better for you, my king. And then Saul, as he slowly gets eaten away at by his anger and his frustration, because people still love David, Saul has killed thousands, but David kills 10,000. So Saul, even when he's having a bad day and he sends David, come Play music for me. Help me feel better. Soothe my soul. Because David's what he's upset with, David can't even make him calm anymore. So Saul begins to do things like shoot arrows and throw spears at David while he just sits there doing what Saul's asked him to do in the first place. I would say David's had a few bad days. This escalates to the point that finally David and the men who support him have to leave the palace of the king and leave all the fine things behind that come with being the king's soldiers and men in the king's court. And they have to run out into the desert and hide in a cave. And they have to steal to eat. And they're starving and hungry and dirty. And this is the great man of David and the mighty men of valor that we hear about, cowering and hiding, dirty in a cave in the desert. What does this have to do with the Lord showing up just in time? Bear with me. I want to read a section of this book to you. It's called A Tale of Three Kings. It's a, it's a nice book. I say a nice book. It's a great book about leadership. I've read it several times. Tiny little book. Quick read. It's by a man named Gene Edwards. It's a fictional account of three different styles of leadership, three different ways of leading and being king, and the way the men who served those three kings reacted and how God honored or didn't honor them based on the way they behaved. There's a section of this book that's a fictional account of a young man who wants to hunt down and find one of these mighty men of David to find out where do you get your power, 
your strength? How did you become so well-renowned? How is it that the Lord took care of you in your time of need? Bear with me as I read this to you briefly. Two generations after the reign of Saul, a young man enthusiastically enrolled himself in the ranks of Israel's army under a new king, the grandson of David. He soon began hearing tales of David's mighty men of valor. He set out to discover if one of those mighty men might still be alive, and if so, to find him and talk to him, though he calculated that such a man might be over a hundred years of age at this point. But at last he discovered that sure enough, one such man still lived. Having learned of his whereabouts, the youth hastened to his dwelling. Anxiously, he knocked on the door and slowly it opened and there stood a giant man, gray and white-haired, wrinkled beyond expectation or recognition. Hesitantly, the young man asked, Are you, sir, one of David's mighty men from long ago? One of those men of whom we've heard so much. And for a long moment, the old man surveyed the young man's face, his features, his uniform. And then in an ancient but firm voice, he replied, never taking his steady gaze off the young man. If you're asking if I'm a former thief and cave dweller, one who followed a sobbing, hysterical fugitive of the king of Israel, then yes, I was one of what you call the mighty men of David. He straightened his shoulders with those last words and ended the sentence with a laugh. But sir, said the young man, you make the great king sound like a weakling. Was he not the greatest of all rulers? The old man corrected him. No, he was no weakling. Then sizing up the motivation for the eager young man's presence at his door, he replied wisely and said softly, nor was he truly a great leader. I'll tell you of my king and his greatness. The clearest memory I have of my king when we lived in the caves is that he lived a life of submission. Yes, David showed me submission, not authority. He taught me not the quick cure, but the art of patience. And that is what changed my life. David taught me losing, not winning. Giving, not taking. He showed me that the leader, not the follower, is the one inconvenienced. He taught me that rebellion is more dangerous than immaturity. That was the greatness of the King David, and this is the appearance of his mighty men. I read that story, I've read it many, many times, and I love this account because we, we build up this idea of the great men of the Bible and think, what wonderful, powerful men who must have lived such dynamic lives. And we read this psalm of David who was praising God for at the moment that he needed to be delivered, delivering him, and here's all the great things that God's done for me and the great things people have to say about the Lord. But we forget the number of years that David spent toiling, dwelling in a castle where he was held prisoner, praised out in public in front of people, but privately tormented by the ones who were supposed to be caring for and helping him rise into his power and his authority. David spent a great deal of time being beaten down and thinking, I could be doing something better, something more important. When will I get delivered from this? He was assaulted by the man who called him into the temple into the first place. He was treated poorly by his mentor. And David finally, at the end of his life, was fleeing, or at the end of Saul's life, was fleeing for his own life, lest Saul kill him. What's the difference between this cave-dwelling David the scared man that we read about in the tale of the last great man, the mighty man of David's army. What's the difference in that cave-dwelling David and the, the David that we read of who becomes a king and writes song of victory and praise and deliverance? Well, the obvious answer is the defeat of his enemies. Everyone in this psalm was laid at his feet. They had absolutely no power over him because God was so great and had come through. In fact, there's this, this idea of God coming through and taking care of us is encapsulated many years later by another writer. If you'll come with me to Philippians 4 and 19. This is a verse I'm sure you've heard before, but I'll give you a moment to get there. Philippians 4 and 19 in the New Testament. Hundreds of years later, after David has long been put in the ground, after Jesus has already walked the earth for his 33 years, been crucified, raised again, and left to go with his father. After all the miracles of the book of Acts, and these men have sung the great praises of David. And finally, we have a writer who condenses this idea of the difference between the old David and the new David. The persecuted David in the cave and the David who would become king. 
Have you found this yet? And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. The Lord will supply all of your needs. There's an interesting implication here when we say the Lord will supply our needs. Have you ever been supplied something you didn't need? Have you ever opened a present on your birthday or at Christmas and thought, Oh, that's nice. May not be the one I wanted. It, it may not even do what I wanted something to do, but I'm, I want to be nice, but I, I, this doesn't satisfy the need. Have you ever had someone, as a pastor, this happens. As a member of the church, this will happen. As a human being who influences other people, like every one of you do, this will happen to you. Someone will come up to you, and they will say to you, I really don't know why, but I've been praying and spending some time with the Lord and I really think he wants me to give you this. We please have the Lord. Thank you. Did you see the look on her face as I handed her a blank, empty envelope? She has no idea what this is about. This has not fulfilled or satisfied any need that she has. She may not have any needs right now, or she may have some needs where she's going, what in the world is this supposed to do? The book says God will supply your needs give you a very deep, powerful revelation this morning. If you don't have a need, there's nothing to supply. If you don't have a need, there's nothing for the Lord to supply for you. You want to know what's the difference between David in the cave and King David? David in the cave had a need and did everything he had to do in order to express it in every way that he could. And he waited for God to supply it in his timing. He didn't say, I sure would like to have, I sure do want, it sure would be wonderful if. Let me tell you something about needs. When you run out of money, you find out what you need because you begin budgeting on what you have to have to survive. You suddenly find out, I don't need Netflix and Hulu at my house. I don't need the PlayStation to work. I don't need lobster. I need food, and the peanut butter sandwich is better than starving. I need entertainment, and I can get that by talking to some other people sitting around the kitchen table and drinking coffee, because that's free. I don't need to go to Carowinds or take a trip to the Bahamas or be in Vegas this week. When you're put in a place where you have need, you find out what is actually important. We tend to walk around spiritually as if we're blind to this concept, because most of you are nodding your heads as I've given you an example of natural needs. Of course, you don't need Netflix. You don't need a trip to the Bahamas. You don't need to eat a five-star dinner every night. No, you don't need those. Oh, duh. Okay, but spiritually, we walk around, and when there's an altar call, we don't want to show up and get prayed for. When somebody says, let me see what I can do for you, no, I don't need your help. I don't want your charity. We walk around denying that we have needs in the first place, and that keeps God from being able to supply for us. I want to tell you something you may not know this morning. We speak of all of the needs that God will supply. God cannot supply until there's a need. And if you're too arrogant and too proud to admit that you need something, you will continue to dwell in the cave. If you are too arrogant and too proud to admit that you have needs, God doesn't have any cause to open heaven for you. If, if abundance comes as a result of constantly living with the attitude that I have a need, then I'm probably doing it wrong. God's not going to supply until there's a need. In fact, I would go so far as to say God is going to continue to allow you to live in a cycle of being personally broken and needy and in lack if you refuse to acknowledge that you need him in the first place. I'm preaching this and I'm excited about it this morning and you can tell I'm a bit enthusiastic because I've had to deal with this personally with the Lord this week. I had some plans for a tax return that I thought was coming that when we filled out the paperwork, I found out was less than half what I thought we were going to get and suddenly all my plans for my finances for the year of 2019 are in the toilet. Now don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying I'm broke. I'm not saying pastor's going to starve to death. I'm saying I had some plans to take care of myself and I didn't necessarily consult the Lord on those plans. And I spent about two days hating my life and living in a cave thinking I was going to die 
because I wasn't listening to the Lord, and I didn't want to admit I had a need. I just wanted to say the way I was going to provide failed, so all is lost. The difference between the David in the cave and the David that's king is that the David who is king finally admitted he had a need and stopped doing what he thought he needed to do on his own and said, Lord, how can I do this your way? If God tells us in this passage in Philippians, I w- God will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. Let's look at what this means. First, we have this phrase in here that says, I will supply. It means I will make full. I will complete. It means there's something missing. If you don't admit there's something missing, there's nothing for God to complete, and therefore he's got no obligation to do anything for you. If there's no hole to fill, then why would you order a bunch of dirt to fill a hole? If there's no lack of money, why would you be asking for money? Well, I'm greedy and selfish. Well, that's a different problem and a different message. If I don't have something I need, why would anyone be obligated to bring it to me? God will supply all your needs. What are needs? Oh, this is fun. Last week we learned a different definition for some words that I've been told I can't preach anymore. (laughs) Because the people have used them the wrong way when you talk about what being a confidence means. This morning, I'm going to talk about needs to you a little bit differently. When you look this up, in the Greek, this passage, that says God will supply your needs. It has nothing to do with what you think you need. This word need literally means necessities for conducting business. Necessities for conducting business. Not just what I think I need to get by. I might think I need a sandwich right now, so honey, get in the kitchen and make me one. First of all, that won't go real well at my house. I don't know how that works. It's your place. But I think I have a need, and I think this is how it can be filled, and that will just help me get by. That sandwich will keep me full until dinner or until whatever happens next. Hopefully until I find a new place to live and a new woman to help cook for me because mine's gone if I send her to the kitchen to cook me a sandwich. (laughs) No. Needs are not just what I need to get by. It's not just what I need for survival. This verse means the Lord will supply what you need to get things done. Not just what you need to maintain. Not just what you need to stay where you're at. Not just what you need to survive until your body finally gives out. Needs are necessities for conducting business. And he will supply those things according to. That phrase, according to, means drawn from an account just like a bank. I've put $1,000 in the bank, and I'm going to need 400 of it. I go to the bank, and they give it back to me. That's according to. Necessities for conducting business drawn out of an account in glory. We understand God's glory. Yes, do I need to explain this? No? Okay, in heaven, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God basically owns everything. There's nothing I have that I can give him that he hasn't already given me, and so forth. Another message, another day. But we look at that according to his riches in glory. And we sometimes, when we recite this verse, like to stop there. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. The end. But that's not what the verse says. His riches in glory in Christ Jesus, meaning relating to the purpose of Christ. So if I take those definitions and read this verse, it says, My God will withdraw from his account every resource necessary for me to conduct any business relating to the purpose of Christ. Suddenly, this verse doesn't mean God's just going to help me survive and get by. This means that as long as I'm about accomplishing the purpose of Christ and acknowledge I can't do it with my own resources, his bank account's wide open for me. But if I'm just wanting enough to get by to make me feel better, he's not obligated to withdraw a penny out of that account on my behalf. I've got to admit that I need something and that it can only come from him. And if he's going to supply for my needs according to his riches in Christ, I better hope that what I'm doing is in Christ and for Christ's purpose. Because even if I'm in need and in lack and don't have what I need, if my life is not focused on fulfilling the purpose of Christ, he's still not obligated to fill that. My needs are created out of my own selfishness, my own great ideas, my own plans. I didn't consult him in the first place and I'm on my own once I get out there. That's all on me. If I want access to the riches and glory according to Christ, I've got to make sure I'm living according to his purpose and that my needs are related to conducting the business of the kingdom, not the business of Rocket Barber's household. See, we've spoken of powers and miracles in the valley. I've shared with you many times my favorite verse, that's Psalm 95.4. His power is in the valley. 
You have to be in a low place where you need the resource in order for God to pour it out. Your most abundant heavenly resource is in a dark place where you feel far from God and you're accustomed to giving up and you think nothing good can come from here. What could possibly come great out of Bethlehem? Well, the Savior of the world in a low place, in a valley. Look at any powerful thing Jesus ever did. Happened in a valley. We've spoken of that. You know from that principle, if you heard me preach it, Christ responds to need. If there's no need, then there's no presence of God. God's not obligated to show up where there aren't needy people. And I want to I, I want to put a put an appendix on that. Needy people does not mean that we're broke financially and that we're poor and that we're, we're living in poverty. It doesn't mean we don't have enough food. It can mean that, but God shows up where there is a spiritual need, where is they, there is a lack of his presence, and there needs to be some injected and added. If I have the presence of God in me, and I'm not conducting the business of him, I'm just going to hang out in church with my church friends and do my church things and listen to just my church music and only watch my church movies and never have anything to do with those people that don't know about church in Christ. I had a girl look at me this week when I made a comment to her about not coming to church, and she said, well, if going to church makes you a Christian, then sitting in the garage makes me a car. I'm like, well, you're right. That's absolutely true. That's how much sense it makes. We can't just hang out in church and be a good Christian. But you're missing the point if you think, I'm just going to be in a place and be a thing. There's a relationship we enter into, and part of the agreement of the relationship is that we will do the business of the Lord. And so if I believe truly everything that's in this book and the Spirit of God is living in me, and I'm a vessel to carry His message and His light into the world, I better make sure that I'm carrying it about the places that need it, and I'm going to where people need that, not just because they're broken hungry, but because spiritually they're destitute and they don't have Christ in their life. And if I'm not conducting that business and using up the resources God's given me, what space am I making for God to bless me with anything else? It's not about me. I've got to do Christ's business if I want to see that abundance poured out. If I find myself broke, I need to look at myself and go, what is it I'm not doing for the kingdom of God that I should be? Am I just sitting around doing the best I can with what I've got to work with and I haven't consulted the king and perhaps my own decisions have made me broke because he's got abundance as long as I'm doing what he's called me to do. If there's no need, there's no presence of God. Also, God will not open heaven and supply your wants. I have a joke that I use a lot when I go to a restaurant and the waitress asks me, can I get you anything? And I say, if you've got a 50-pound bag of hundreds, I'd like one of those. You ever done the math on that? It's about $750,000, 50 pounds, $100 bills. I, that'd be nice. That's my want. I'd like to have a lot of things. I want to have more guitar equipment. I took Josh yesterday to Guitar Center to help him buy some equipment he needs because he's learning to play guitar. And while we were there, I looked at some other guitars, and I said, man, if I had... If I just had $600 for that and $1,200 for that and $1,100 for this, and then there was a drum set that River liked. It's like, there's a lot of things I want. And it'd be very easy for me to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I can come up with a good reason that the church needs that because the church would worship better if I had that blue Les Paul. The church would probably praise a lot harder if I had a blue Les Paul. They, they really would. You know, Lord, River would be a better drummer and would learn to worship you much faster if he had this, this brand new electronic drum set that he wants that we could put in his room. So he, that, that, that's what it is, Lord. See, he could practice over there quietly and not bother anybody. I wouldn't have to unlock the church for him every time I wanted to play and sit here and listen to him be noisy. And it, it's, it's, it's all for you, Jesus. I want these things and I want them for you. No, <laughs> we do that though. God doesn't say I'm going to take care of your wants. He says there's plenty of abundance, but the abundance comes from you creating a need for the abundance in the first place and doing the work with what he's given you and then perhaps there'll be some extra. But there's no guarantee of that because this isn't transactional. This is God funding his own work. If I say I'm going to do go do a construction job, my money is going to flow toward, toward the needs of that job. I'm not just going to automatically throw an extra $10,000 at a construction project because I feel like it and the guys out there probably will find something they want. So here's some extra for you. If I'm a decent businessman, I want what's good for me. God's not an idiot. He's generous, and he'll do it right and do it good, but he doesn't say, I'm just going to throw all the blessings of heaven at you because you think you'd like to have them. I'll supply your needs according to you doing my work. It doesn't say he'll supply your wants. It doesn't say that he'll open heaven and supply anything other than things related to his purpose. 
And God will not supply until there is a need. And having laid this foundation, here's where we get to the title of the message this morning, Just In Time. I told you about David. And when we go all the way back to the beginning of his story, that David and Goliath story that we know, if you read that story, David did not, when he was called from the field, put a sling in his pocket and pick out three stones. David did not, when he was meeting with Saul, to get fitted for Saul's armor and find out it didn't fit him and he couldn't take it into battle, he didn't say, give me a minute, I'm going to go pick up a couple of rocks. David, when he went into battle against Goliath, walked out with a sling and on the way onto the battlefield, looking the enemy in the eye that has beheaded many of the Israelites that an entire army is terrified of. This man that we believe could have been as tall as eight feet tall, who's holding a sword that they believe weighed as much as 80 pounds, an 80 pound sword. You don't even have to swing that thing to cut somebody's head off. You just drop it. I wouldn't want to get near it because I'm accident prone, even when it's not that dangerous. And David is staring the giant down and walking towards him and still doesn't have the weapon that he needs to destroy what stands between him and the will of God yet. And yet he kept walking. And as he's walking, he finds three stones and puts them in his pouch and loads one. That's about as last minute as it gets when you're staring down the man that wants to behead you and you still don't have in your hand what it takes to do the work he's called you to do. This is not the only time in David's existence this has happened. He's a shepherd. It's his job to stay out in the field all day long by himself, taking care of hundreds of sheep. Because if he doesn't, dad's going to be angry. Because the sheep are how we make money. We sell the wool. We eat the food. We sell them for offerings. The, the sheep are our livelihood. They're our live stock. They're what we have put our life trusted into. We can't let anything bad happen. Do you think David ever saw the day coming when he would have to fight a bear with his bare hands? Do you think David got like a P90X for bear fighting? Do you think he went into an MMA club and said, teach me how to beat a bear? And he was absolutely 100% prepared for it? Sure, he was strong. He had done some great work. He was out doing hard work in the field. He was in good shape. But he didn't even know that a bear was coming for him until the minute it charged out of the woods. And he didn't even know he could beat the bear until the adrenaline surged through his veins at the last minute. He didn't wake up all jacked up that morning going, something's going to happen and I'm just going to tear it apart. <laughs> David woke up that morning going, it's a regular day and I'm going to go do my father's business like I always do. And when something came up at the last minute, the adrenaline kicked in and the fact that he lived a healthy life and was in good shape kicked in and he tore a bear to pieces with his bare hands. I don't know anything more last minute than adrenaline while the bear's running at you. And then if the bear wasn't enough, do you think David ever thought that would happen again? It's like getting struck by lightning. Sure, yeah, I'm going to take on some wild beast. And yet not too long after that, there's a lion that comes running out of the woods and he has to beat that thing to death with his hands. Do you think he even had time to consider, oh, I got this figured out because I beat the bear already. I'll just take this technique and that technique. No, the lion is running at him. Ah! The adrenaline in the last minute. David found himself in those three, three occasions in a place where he had a need. A need that he wasn't even sure existed moments ago. And he had what he needed, but it was just in time. When you're staring down something that you don't know you can take it out, that you think for sure it's going to kill me, you have to realize my God will supply my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ if I'm living my life on purpose with my heart focused on getting his work done. The resources that I need may not come until the bear reaches back to take the last swipe at me, but you better believe it's coming. And we've got to learn to think just in time and not in my time. I thought I was going to pay my car off with my tax return. The Lord has something else in mind. You thought this job was going to be the last job I ever had or it was going to be the key to the next thing I'm going to do. You thought this would be the last car I would buy. You thought I was going to retire here. You thought this house would be how I funded my trip around the world. You thought, fill in the blank. But that wasn't what God had in mind. And there's a need that's going to be created when you realize this isn't going to do what I thought. Are you going to crumble and fall and feel terrible and miserable and bad about yourself and whine in a cave? 
Or are you going to say, I've got a God that will supply my needs and I've been doing his work and I'm going to keep doing it even if I have to walk toward the bear while he raises his arm and gets ready to swipe at me. God says, I'm taking care of this, but I'm doing it just in time until the need is actually there. You may perceive the thing you're up against right now as a need, and it's not a need yet. I need to pay Netflix. Well, no, you don't. What you need to do is have an extra $8 next week when there's a hungry guy that's going to say, hey, I'm starving. And not just because I need a burger. I've had some bad luck in my life. There's something about you, and I feel like I need to talk to you. Can you take me to lunch? What I think I need is something completely different. What I'm freaking out about right now that I don't have provision for, if I'm in the will of God in that moment, I can say with confidence, this might look like a need, but it in fact is not one. Because God will supply needs. If I lose this thing that I'm scared of losing, it must be something that I don't need to accomplish the purpose of God. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm not saying don't work. I'm not saying go get everything you can for free. I'm saying if you are living your life as best you can for the purpose of Christ and in connection with him, and that relationship is in good standing, and you're up against something where you don't see the solution, one of two things is the case. Either it's not a need at all, or the need is not so pressing yet that God's going to provide. But if it is a need, in fact, he promises that there's a just-in-time solution for it. We sing a song sometimes here on Sunday morning called On Time God. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. Not right on my time. I'm sure Mary and Martha didn't think that three days after Lazarus died was the time for Jesus to show up. In fact, I seem to remember in that story... The sisters were like, well, Lord, if you'd have come earlier, what were you thinking, Jesus? We had a need, and you didn't meet it on time. Yes, yes, I did. I had something else in mind, daughter. If we do not live with a mindset and a heart attitude which actively acknowledges our need of him, he will allow us to continually find ourselves in a place of need that is caused by our own self-reliance. If I don't live with an attitude that I need Christ and I get this attitude that I can take care of me, God is a gentleman and will not force himself on me and he will let me lead myself to the destructive end that I'm bound for anytime I try to take care of myself. And he's not doing that because he's mean. He's not punishing you. If I step off the side of the cliff, I'm going to fall down. Those are the consequences. Well, why didn't God stop that bad thing from happening? Well... God stepping in and supernaturally changing how things happen is a fairly rare occurrence. We got a big book here that, by my count, only 77 times did God change the natural order of things in order to cause something else to happen. The rest of this book is about people learning to live in relationship with him and learning to walk out what he wanted them to do and being content with him supplying their needs, not with him supernaturally undoing what should be the consequence of their bad decision. God will let you walk out the path you're walking without him if that's what you want to do. He's not going to force you. But he's not going to bail you out of the consequences of it either because he's not obligated to. He says, I gave you an opportunity to do this my way and to have access to all these riches. And when you came to a place of need, let me supply them. You had the option and you still have it. I'm not necessarily going to bail you out of this. You might need to pray for crop failure for what you've planted Because it's still going to come up out of the ground. But we can start from this point and we can begin living as we should. And I'll begin providing for the needs that are created while you're living for me. See, there's, there's not a place where we said, oh, I've done too many bad things. I've lived on my own and I've got these terrible consequences in front of me that are going to ruin me and they're the end of my life. Well, no. You may have to suck up the consequences of what you've done up to this point. But we can draw a line right here and say, I'm going to stop relying on me and start relying on the Lord. And everything we're talking about this morning is at your fingertips just as much today as it could have been yesterday or a month ago or a year ago or 10 years ago when you stepped off the doing what God asked me to do train. You can hop back on just like this. It's a little harder with those consequences following you around. And you might have to work a little more. And you might have to go through a season of some really bad crops being harvested. 
that you got to just toss and count them as a loss. But that doesn't mean the Lord won't start providing from this point forward for what you create in service to Him. Abundance comes as the result of consistently living with an attitude which acknowledges our need of Christ. I want you to look at something else with this verse. We're getting close to closing. We looked this morning at this verse in Philippians, and we, we all know that verse, my God will supply all my needs, 419. But back up a little bit before that to verse 16. Actually, before you even look at 16, look with me at the beginning of 419. Do you see the first word there that nobody ever reads? The first word of 419 in my Bible is and. That's a weird way to begin a sentence or a statement, and. We skip over that. We just say, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. We leave off the and at the beginning and we leave off the Jesus Christ at the end. Because that doesn't always suit me. This and, just in the English language, it joins two things together. Jesse and Rocket. We are joined together, two people, one marriage. You know, chocolate and peanut butter. They go together, great. And peanut butter by itself is just weird. I mean, peanut butter is fine, but why would you say and peanut butter? I like an and peanut butter sandwich. You sound crazy. This sentence starts with an and, which means there's something before it, which is why I want you to back up with me, and let's look at 16 through 18. For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts for my need several times, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I've received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Ephroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will supply What's the writer talking about here? Some people gave me some things. They gave me some gifts, some nice ones. But I wasn't doing what I was doing to get what you could give me. I was doing what I did because I wanted to see you increase in your relationship in Christ. That's what he's talking about, is increasing your account. He says, but I've received everything in full. Yes, I got the gifts you sent, and I thank you for them. And I am abundant in my supply. I am fully supplied. I've received everything you sent me, and it's more than I need. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It pleases God and my God. Everything I've got that you sent me is great. I didn't have everything I needed before you sent those things, but even at the moment that I'm in receipt of what I need, and it seems to have come from Hank, or it seems to have come from Christy, the truth is it came from the Lord, and I'm not self-sufficient in it. The and at the beginning of this is a conclusion to, yes, I have naturally got in hand everything I need because of what you've provided for me. However, God supplies my needs. I know where the supply came from. I understand you sent it, or it came from your people, or it was sent by whatever means it it arrived, but it came from God. It came when I needed it, not when I thought I should have it. Provision only comes when needed. It comes just in time, but only when we have set our minds and our actions upon accomplishing the purpose of Christ. As I'm closing this morning, I want to share one last story with you. There, there's a woman named Corey Ten Boom. You may have heard of her. You may not. She had some, there was a lot of information about her in the 80s that made her very popular. During the Holocaust, she and her father were involved in a ministry that helped people escape what was happening in the Holocaust. And there's a story that she tells in one of her books where she says, When she was a child, I once asked my father... Father, I'm afraid. And her father says, why? And she says, I'm afraid that I won't have enough to please God. I'm afraid that I can't do enough to please God. I'm afraid that I won't have everything I need to do what God wants me to do with my life. And it will make him unhappy. And she says, my father thought for a moment... And then he answered me, Corey, when I send you to Amsterdam for supplies, do I send you to the train station with a ticket? She says, no. He says, when do you get the ticket? 
She says, at the station before I leave. He says, where do you get the money for the ticket? She says, from you. He says, do I give you the money for the ticket weeks before you have to go? And she says, no. He says, when do I give you the money for the ticket? She says, just as I'm leaving to go to the train station. And she said, my father said to me, so it is with your father, God. 